You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your lit host, Abraham. And I am your gnarly host, Shane. Excellent. We're a psychology podcast. And we, we, I mean, we tackle all sorts of things related to psychology. We tackle the weird to the popular and we, we view it through a behavior analysis sort of lens, but we don't really, we, we avoid the jargon, I guess. We try not to make it sound too technical. Doesn't always work, but we do our best. We also like to cover things that are a little bit heavier and more uh, thought provoking. And, and I mean, hopefully all of our stuff is thought provoking, but then we like to cover things that are a little bit lighter and fun and give us a good chuckle. And so I think that this episode is going to fall into the latter. Yeah, I think this one, this will be fun. And before we dive into it, I like to remind everyone, if you'd like to support the show, you can go to Patreon, leave us a rating and review, buy some merch, tell a friend, that sort of thing. I'll give some more information about how other ways you can support us at the end of this discussion. But for now, I am really excited to talk about what we're doing today, which, as we said, are these these sayings, these idioms. And this came from the idea that I recognized just a normal conversation that sometimes the things that we say, at least in the United States, American culture, they're kind of weird. This is something that's been on my periphery for some time. Only I think working in the autism community and working with autistic folks, sometimes idioms don't work. Yeah. In particular, I was working with a learner one time and I said something about red flags and he was concerned about where the red flags were. <laughs> and it turned into kind of a a, a little bit of a, a, a teaching moment for me to kind of learn, oh, OK, so I need to be a little bit clearer in the language because sometimes idioms muddy the language, especially when people are learning the language as well. Yeah, definitely. Idioms are really fascinating and people just say really bizarre things. Some of the idioms that we've grown accustomed to. If you really think about how they sound from maybe an outsider perspective or even what they mean, if you were to take them at their sort of literal face value, they could be a little alarming, probably. <laughs> yes. So these idioms, these are, you know, we're talking about phrases, expressions, figurative language, common sayings, the things like that. And and this is rooted mostly in this discussion. We're going to be we're going to be talking about common ones in American culture. I wanted to look into a lot of ones sort of around the world to get sort of a smattering of of different sayings that are out there. And this it, there were just so many, so many that I found that I, I couldn't <laughs> even really spend time. Uh, I, we're not going to comprehensively even rem- get close to covering the scope of idioms in like American culture. Oh, yeah. So even, you know, trying to expand out to the rest of the world is basically it something that wasn't really going to make sense in this conversation. So that being said, <laughs> from people from other cultures, if you have some fun sayings that, that you use, please write in and let us know. We can share those with people. I think that'd be a really great follow-up to this discussion. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I uh, really find this particular topic fascinating. So like if you, and as somebody who has tried to study other languages, like I spent some time studying Spanish and worked in the space where I was learning ASL, when you are learning languages, there are idioms within those spaces. And at the entry levels, you're probably not learning them as much. And then when you kind of start reading and kind of communicating, they become so unique and kind of, they definitely throw you off a little bit. So I'm excited to kind of see why Americans like to confuse people with really complex and weird sayings for random things. Absolutely. So we're going to discuss why we use idioms to the best of our ability, where they come from. And most of this discussion, honestly, is we're just going to take a whole bunch of idioms that we found and talk about what the idiom means, give an example of using the idiom, and then from where we were able to find origins of that idiom, we'll explain what those origins are. So let's get started by doing a little bit of background work first. So idioms are a group of words with a particular cultural meaning, different or even confusing if considering each word individually. So basically what it is, is you've got a group of words or a saying or a phrase. And if you look at it individually or if you look at it literally, it typically doesn't make any sense. Right. It doesn't actually mean what is in the expression. But it's understood by folks that speak the native language or the native audience, the group of people who've kind of heard that phrase and and can apply a context to it. Yeah, as you said, for those people who are trying to learn English for the first time and it's not their first language, this is one of the things that I found that reportedly makes English a really difficult language to learn is these idioms. And in particular, I found some places suggest that particularly in English that we speak in 
a lot of idioms that a lot of our communication actually <laughs> uses idioms yeah. as, as basic forms of communication and that you just kind of get used to it. That also is something that was kind of striking to me and realizing as I was writing definitions for some of these idioms and reading of them is that some of the idioms use idioms in their definitions <laughs> and like using in examples, I wanted to use more idioms. So it is difficult to get away from, I think. It's like Christopher Nolan wrote the English language. He's just like, he's just like total inception of, of idioms. I like that. <laughs> right. I mean, there you go. That's probably just a whole nother thing where it's like, if you've never seen inception and now that becomes a confusing thing and, and we're going to, and English is just a weird thing. So now some experts suggest that these phrases can be ways to express ourselves, to experience and evoke humor in ourselves and others, or to communicate in a playful way. It does t- kind of take the bite out of some more serious conversations. Yeah. We did a whole episode on euphemisms as well, and we could probably kind of link all this stuff together in terms of how Good sometimes point. our language is designed to be softened so that we're not hurting people's feelings or maybe providing a, a, an example within a description of something. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of different ways that these might get used. And so and we're going highlight that as we go another reason that people use idioms or at least of the function that they can serve in our language and, and i think that's all relevant in understanding why these come up as we're getting into this is that there is a certain amount of just demonstrating sort of cultural understanding and competence and being able to communicate with relevance inside of a given culture and so i'm not sure that i would call it like a hazing or sort of an induction ritual sort of thing But it has the element of demonstrating that you fit because you recognize the common like parlance of the culture in which you're embedding yourself or or participating in some way. When you are using an idiom or you're having a conversation and somebody uses even an analogy that doesn't make sense, it is kind of isolating, right? Yeah. Like when we use idioms and people understand those, then there's like a, a this kind of, I guess, feeling of comfort. Right. It, the, the the tone becomes conversational. And then when somebody uses an idiom that doesn't quite make sense or uses an analogy that doesn't quite make sense, then it throws off the entire conversation and can actually like socially isolate someone. So I think of specifically, I think a 50 year old virgin when they're all kind of talking about their exploits and the main character talks about feeling a woman's breast. And it's like, yeah, it just feels like a, a bag of sand. And bag all of them just kind of go, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> like, and it was just one of those, <laughs> it was one of those moments where it's like, it was so such a strange kind of thing to say that it did isolate him a little bit. And it kind of that was kind of like a plot point for the entire movie. And I'm certainly not saying that that movie has aged very well. I'm not going to I'm not going to go into that. But it was a moment that I always that always sticks out when it comes to languaging and describing and using metaphors or idioms or anything like that, where if it doesn't quite make sense, it's very off putting. It feels very weird. I guess it could probably lead into some uncanny valley type of stuff, too. Oh, interesting. I would not have would not have thought about that, but I, I like that <laughs> comparison is a, a good one to make. Yeah. Now, many people who are listening to our podcast are somewhat familiar, at least with B.F. Skinner and his work. And we also talk about relational frame theory and some of these other languaging sort of theories. And so I was, I was trying to look around and see what has been said about idioms and, and expressions and that sort of thing in sort of the philosophical behavioral sort of world. Actually, I had a really tough time finding anything super concrete. Most of what I found was related to analogies, which I think is a, a related topic for sure. Yeah. But what I did find is, is Skinner talks about these things called tacts for those who are not in the behaviorist sort of world. It, it's uh, labeling, it's naming is a, is a way to think loosely about tacts and what those are. And I was thinking about, he, he has this whole section on what, what are called metonymical tacts, which is referring to something in place of something else. So we might say uh, the example that he gives in in his text, Verbal Behavior from 1957, is we might refer to the White House when we're actually talking about the president or about a particular administration. And so that's an example of tacting something or labeling something in place of something else. So that was one place that I found that was relevant to this sort of discussion. Another, I think, is talking about introverbals, which has to do with essentially chains of words that are related to one another through context and a history of learning. Again, I'm speaking sort of colloquially here. But this idea of some of these phrases are, are phrases that are they're words that commonly occur together in common contexts. And so that's where it seems to be sort of related. And maybe more broadly to just attack itself under certain kinds of control or uh circumstances in a conversation or something. So that was sort of what I found there. Anything else to add there, Shane? 
I would go back to cite that, you know, within the verbal behavior realm, there's been so much research that has been done to kind of expand verbal behavior. And the fact that we're not able to find something for, all the way from 1957, where we started actually having discussions around verbal behavior all the way up until today is indicative of how complex or maybe how unimportant idioms might be. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know really kind of what to say to that. I think it is interesting that we haven't spent more time researching this or understanding this phenomenon and seeing, you know, why it's so culturally or socially significant for people. It is surprising just given the fact that as we described, it seems to make up a pretty significant chunk of like regular common conversations and cultural practice. And maybe because it, at least some of the ones we're going to pack are so uniquely American, it seemed like tackling idioms from a broader human perspective was a, a bigger task that required a lot of time. Someone wasn't going to sink into that. I don't know. But <laughs> right. nevertheless, we have less to go on than I thought we might uh, in initially preparing for that. But that's okay, because mostly I thought it would be fun to actually unpack these idioms. I just wanted to try and give some really useful background as much as possible on what these are and where they come from and how we use them. So we're going to we're going to leave leave it on a teaser and we're going to um, let the the ad ghouls come in and do their thing. And we'll be right back. OK, so we have sort of described what idioms are and how they're used. Let's just spend the rest of this time talking about some idioms. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So where do you want to start? We've got some themes. Yeah. So we, we are going to kind of bunch a couple up i don't know we could start with money because money talks right <laughs> that's fair yeah i think to describe this i noticed that a lot of idioms rely on similar themes and how the idiom is structured there's things like money one i call destruction which you'll see what that means when we get to it there's a lot about food animals a lot about animals there is an unbelievably large a number of idioms attributable to horses alone <laughs> like a surprisingly huge amount there's also like uh, we'll maybe get to this later but i found one blog that was 19 different idioms related to skin <laughs> which i was not <laughs> expecting yeah it's bizarre how much is out there and then uh, i mean hopefully what we do here is we kind of start to kind of dive into this and you'll see how often you actually use idioms because you probably don't even realize right because they're so common that you use idioms in in so much of your every day so hopefully this will kind of like start to kind of shine a light on that a little bit yeah and as shane alluded well, there's way too many in here for us to actually unpack them all so we're kind of going to jump around a little bit and just pick some but yeah, we can start with money. So which one from money speaks to you, Shane? I think we should talk about cost an arm and a leg. Okay. I feel like that's a good place to start. There's some interesting stuff here, and it's something that's commonly used. Also, at the time that we're recording this, and I imagine at the time it's released, we're in the middle of a pretty significant inflation situation going on in the United States. Mm -hmm. And with the, the war that's happening... On the other side of the planet and gas prices have have more than doubled many parts of the country. I think this is relevant. As a matter of fact, there was a gas station and I'm sure the others have done this, but there was a gas station not too far from my house that for many, many years, the price of gas was arm and leg. Those the, <laughs> the two things they listed as their nice. the gas prices. Yeah. Nice. So anyway, yeah, nice. the idiom is costs an arm and a leg. And the meaning of this idiom is something that is very expensive. It's seeming to imply that the cost is so high, you would have to actually permanently lose one of your arms or one of your legs. Yeah. So the example is flights to the conference this year cost an arm and a leg and flights are more expensive right now. So it would suggest that flights are that expensive. So, so much so that I'd have to give up a body part. Yes, very much. Is that a sufficient example? Do you have any others you want to throw in there? I think that gives context. I mean, ultimately, like, you know, you could say the price of gas costs an arm and a leg. We could say the price of avocados costs an arm and a leg. Whole foods prices cost you an arm and a leg. Like, I yeah. think there's a lot of different things that we could talk about. So capitalism lends itself to that type of idiom quite a bit. Yeah. I would buy this car, but it costs an arm and a leg. That sort of thing. Yeah. All right. Now, the origins of this saying were really difficult to pin down. And that actually, unfortunately, ended up being the case for most of the idioms we're going to track. And it seems that largely what happened was these sort of got shaped up over time and they evolved from one form into another. They may have started as an analogy or some kind of metaphor and then got slimmed down into just a, an expression that was used. 
and just sort of slowly evolved that way. And so there often aren't really clear origins to some of these, which is unfortunate. Now, some of them there are, which is really fun, but this one is very mixed. One that I found was that 18th century artists and sculptors charged more to depict limbs. So literally charging for an arm or a leg to be added to the sculpture. (laughs) Yeah. Even saw a suggestion that this is why many busts don't have limbs. Now, that being said, I found another source, uh, maybe more than one, that said that this is apocryphal and that there was no real evidence that limbs were categorically more difficult to create. Maybe they suggested that including limbs meant that it was a larger piece and so uh, larger pieces were more expensive. But there was some dispute about whether that's actually why or where that saying comes from. Yeah. There's another in reference to soldiers who might lose an arm or leg in war. Thus, the price of war was literally an arm and a leg. And so that is a pretty literal interpretation of this. But again, it's one source that suggests that, but doesn't really have any sort of kind of solid proof that that's where it comes from. Another was people saying that something was so important and valuable that they would pay with their arm and their or their leg. And so that is an, just another source that I found suggesting where that it comes from. And again, that one's pretty literal as well. Yeah. So there's a, a an 1849 edition of Sharp's London Journal that says specifically, quote, he felt as if he could gladly give his right arm to be cut off if it would make him at once old enough to go and earn money instead of Lizzie, end quote. Another one from an Iowa newspaper, the Burlington Daily Hawkeye, and this was from July 1875. So, What a name. Yeah, that is a, quite a name for a journal, the Burlington Daily Hawkeye. <laughs> so 1875, so 140-ish years. A man who owes five-year subscription to the Gazette is trying to stop his paper without paying up, and the editor is going to grab that back pay if it takes a leg. Oh, yeah. that's aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like that. There are different versions of this phrase in different languages. So in France, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce this because I failed French in college because I was like, oh, it's a romantic language. I took four years of Spanish. French should be easy. Was not easy. So I dropped out. I'm going to try it. Go ahead. I think it's Sacu uh, les yeux de la tête. Oh, that was so much better than I would have done. I would have been like, <laughs> Cacute. Les, and that would have been, it would have been real bad. Uh, anyway, it means it costs the eyes from the head. So that's a version of that. And there's a Bulgarian one, which is not in letters that I know how to pronounce. And so I'm just going to read the <laughs> translation, which is it costs one mother and father. It's a similar idea. Yeah. Similar ideas. It makes sense. Like, right. So here we are again. It's about cost. That's really what it comes down to. Yep. It costs an arm and a leg means it's very expensive. OK, so we're good on that one. Uh, what else should we take on? I like graveyard shift. We like spooky things. This is another one related to money. Yeah, so graveyard shift means that you're working hours in the middle of the night when most people are sleeping, often midnight to sunrise, but it can be overnight hours. And the example here would be, I need to sleep during the day because I work the graveyard shift. That's what we're getting at here. This is another one that has an apocryphal story of this idea that people would have to wait in a graveyard to listen for bells that might ring if someone was accidentally buried alive. And this has come up, I believe, (laughs) on the show before and talking about this sort of creepy practice where when people would not be really they wouldn't know how to check for whether someone was actually dead they might appear dead if their breathing was so shallow and their heart rate so low that they couldn't detect their vital signs they would assume that they were dead and then they would put them in a coffin and bury them but if they ever exhumed somebody and found like scratch marks on the inside of their coffin lid that would be very alarming indicating that that person had been put in the ground prematurely yeah and so then they would attach these strings to bells that would go down into the coffin and then the bell would be mounted above the ground so that if someone was ever buried alive they could pull the string ring the bell and be disinterred from their (laughs) what was supposed to be an eternal slumber (laughs) well and so there's idea that people would have to watch the graveyard night in case it happened but this it's unlikely unlikely this is actually the case for several reasons one there is no evidence that this happened and two People could ring the bell at any time of day when you're down in a coffin. Like to you, there are no hours, right? Right. And so like if you're ringing at some point, if you just keep ringing, like someone will be around to hear it like it wouldn't have to be at night. So it doesn't really make sense to have someone just watching it at nighttime. Right. And you better believe if I get buried alive and I have access to a bell, I'm ringing it until that dirt is off of me. Like, I'm not going to like ring it only at night. And I'm certainly not going to stop at any point in time. I'm like, I am buried alive. You better you better dig me up right now. <laughs> exactly. I'm ringing that bell nonstop. Yeah. So literally nothing to do with working in or around graveyards. What I found that seemed like it was the most likely explanation is this idea that it was working during hours when the world is quiet and as lonely as a graveyard. 
And so that's maybe where the expression came from. That to me makes more sense where it's like, you know, everybody is resting, you know, so like you're working the shift where everybody's rest. So I, I understand that too. Yeah. Again, it's one of those things where it probably got shaped up over time. It was probably used in some publication somewhere that nobody can find. And it was like, I imagine that somebody probably put it as like a, quirk in some kind of ad looking for like a, a you know somebody to attend to the graveyard at night and they're like "Ooh, the graveyard shift and it was like kind of like a tongue-in-cheek thing and it turned into an idiom too like because you know that happens i mean that's what happened with bootylicious right <laughs> bootylicious became like a word from a song and now it's in the dictionary so wonderful the evolution of language at hand <laughs> we've watched it happen it's wild <laughs> What are we taking on next? Because there's so many under the destruction theme, I think it's worth maybe diving into that section, you think? Sure. All right. One that I I was interested in looking into because this is one that I think I say a lot, at least, and I've heard other people use is splitting hairs. So, Shane, why do we say splitting hairs? Well... I think that comes from a place where, you know, we make unnecessarily tiny distinctions and related concepts. And so what ends up happening is it's often used to describe an argument to which people are involved in some kind of, I will say a heated discussion or just just kind of a, a specific discussion. But they'll argue trivial points so that they can win the contest or win the argument at all costs. I mean, they will literally go, ah, you know, it's like it's that kid that's like, you know, it's like 1201. Mm-hmm. After midnight, yeah, and somebody's like, "Oh, you know," that, so they say something like Wednesday, and they're like, actually it's Thursday. Like that's yeah. the that's the splitting hairs kid, you know, right? Making really really small distinctions. An example is trying to define idioms and figures of speech as different ideas is splitting hairs <laughs> because <laughs> idioms and figures of speech are basically the same thing, and someone will probably yeah. try and tell you that they're different, and that's because they're they're, they're hair splitters. That's what they are. Yeah, they're hair splitters. So the origin, no one offered a clear origin of this. It has been used since at least Shakespeare or before in reference to the idea that a human hair is so small that splitting it would be both difficult and pointless and possibly even impossible. That's where this term kind of seems to lend itself, right? Particularly at the time this was being used, there were few tools, if any, that could be precise and delicate enough to split a hair. So they were finding that like there's that trope in movies that have archers right. where archers will like split an arrow. Yeah. I feel like that's one of those things where it's like the implication that it is, is their, their aim is so precise that they could do that. And it's just to a point where it's just, it's useless at this point, right? Splitting hair is just useless. You don't need to do it. Yeah. And that's why I put this in the destruction section was the idea of splitting things. Although this could also go in body parts cause it's splitting hairs. So <laughs> It's hard to pin this down. That's yeah. that's the whole issue with qualitative research. <laughs> yeah, not that it matters. Themes are tough. Yeah, it was just just a thing. Yeah, it sounds like you're splitting hairs there. All right, which one which one stands out to you here? I really like bury the hatchet. That's one that's come up a few times. There's such a visceral imagery that goes along with that. Yeah, that I feel like uh, it's a pretty powerful idiom. What do you uh, imagine when you hear bury the hatchet? What's your visual imagery? You know, my first thought is like burying a hatchet in like uh, some kind of timber or wood or lumber or something like that. Like I imagine it's like that because often hatchets are used to to chop up smaller bits of wood and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But then uh, I also like the literal interpretation where somebody's taking their tool and just burying it somewhere, like just covering it in dirt and leaving it underground. I think that's just a funny image for some reason. Like I don't know why anybody would do that, but you know. Well, you're about to find out because that's not too far off, actually. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) Yeah. So when we say bury the hatchet, what we mean is to settle a dispute or generally make peace with some kind of adversary. The way that I've often used this is with someone who maybe I used to be close with or somebody who I like had some kind of falling out or some event happened where things didn't go well. And then to repair that relationship, I'd say bury the hatchet. I think it's also just been shortened to let's bury this. Yeah, has become another way of phrase that's very related. But yeah, that's that's what the phrase means. Yeah. So like the example of like we had a long talk, we were finally able to bury the hatchet means that like, hey, we spent a lot of time working on something. Now we're at peace. We have moved on. We have resolved this. There is no tension now at this point in time. Yeah. And it's not to say you couldn't bury the hatchet with someone you've always been enemies with, but that's just the way that I've I've tended to use it is with people yeah. with whom I was like, you know, friendly. Yeah, so let's talk about then where this comes from. The sources that I found suggested that this was comes from indigenous American leaders from different tribes who would literally bury hatchets as a symbolic gesture of peace. And some writing indicates that this term was used as far back as 1644, 
although a more clear example of the use of this term was noted in 1680. And so Samuel Sewell wrote in 1680 where he recounts the bearing of hatchets by Native American tribes saying, quote, meeting with the Sachem, the tribal leaders, they came to an agreement and buried two axes in ye ground, which ceremony to them is more significant and binding than all articles of peace, the hatchet being a principal weapon with them, end quote. Yeah, so the idea here being this like, I no longer need this weapon because you're no longer my enemy. And so symbolically digging a hole, putting it in the hole and covering it with dirt to say like, I don't, I can't even get to it now. I'm not just going to shelve it. It's like literally underground. Right. I've returned it to the earth. There's no need for this. And so I think that's, that's uh, the symbolic gesture. At least this is the source that I found. And I think that symbolic gesture is really beautiful, right? When you, when you think about it, like the idea, I really also like, and you'll see this kind of maybe that goes along with some idioms is that maybe it was a very literal phrase at some point in time, or maybe it was something that was a useful phrase that had some kind of function at the time. But as time moves on and we move away from certain practices, it loses its meaning, right? It loses its purpose. Like, I don't know anybody in my life that carries around a hatchet using it as a weapon. If they did have a weapon, they had a hatchet and they were using it. Then I'm kind of like, huh. That's that's a problem. You should probably get some help as you think about it. Like maybe some of these terms like they lose their utility because the individual parts of the term no longer hold social meaning Fair. Well, I'm getting alert that we're being hacked by advertisers, so I'm going to go deal with that and be right back. Okay, we're back. So let's just talk some more idioms. Should we do more from the destruction pile or do you want to move on to a new category? I'm good with either because we have so many to unpack that it's it's very difficult to select like where to go. Like I, I feel like I want to bounce all over these notes. Yeah, I kind of do too. And actually, I like the ones from the food section, but there are a million animal idioms. And so I'm not going to even get into the horses one right now i think what i'll even do is i might maybe at the end of this i'll just list what they are uh-huh. because some of them i think will surprise people that that those come from horse horse and horse racing and that sort of thing but there are some quick and easy ones i think we can knock out on here one very common one that i hear all the time is the elephant in the room it's a saying so common you'll see it on tv shows it's in books it's in popular culture it's everywhere The meaning of this phrase is something important that is understood by all the people involved. Usually it's uncomfortable to talk about, but it's too important to ignore. That's sort of what it what it means. The when we say the elephant in the room is there's a topic that everyone like we're we're literally all in the room and there's a topic that we're all know that we maybe need to talk about, but we're either hesitant to address it or we're gonna start by saying, let's talk about the elephant in the room. So an example of this would be, we knew this meeting would be tense. So let's just address the elephant in the room, right? And that just suggests that everybody's aware we've got a problem to deal with. I feel like a really good example today would be from that movie Encanto, where they don't talk about Bruno, but they really should talk about Bruno. Bruno is absolutely the the elephant in the room. And the fact that they don't talk about it suggests that everybody knows about Bruno, but we don't talk about Bruno. He's the elephant in the room. The other elephant in the room is, spoiler alert, skip ahead like 10 seconds is that the main character doesn't have any powers and like, so nobody kind of wants to talk about it, Mm -hmm. but it, it comes up a lot. So yeah, unfortunately, yeah, (laughs) they're not talking about Encanto though. We're talking about elephants. (laughs) Unfortunately, the first written account of this saying is an American publication of some sort from 1959. So fairly recent as far as some of these go. Oh, wow. But there was nothing I could find that actually spoke to where that person who wrote that article got it. Um, And it's poorly understood the history of this term. Otherwise it seems that most people who were talking about this, where I was reading up about idioms suggested that it just seemed intuitive Mm -hmm. that if there was an elephant in the room, that people would talk about it. And so anything that is an important topic is an elephant in the room, metaphorically speaking. And that was all I I was able to find. Okay. Like you said, there's, there's going to be times where it's like the origins of these things are underwhelming, but the phrases themselves are a lot of fun. So, I'm going to go ahead and drop into talking about pigeonholed because that comes up a lot in our field. We hear we hear the term pigeonholed a lot, and I think that's a fun one. So uh, what this means is we are restricted to a small category or narrow range of activities. An example would be something like, I feel like I'm being pigeonholed in my current position. What you're talking about is that you don't have a lot of scope or breadth or kind of expansiveness in a position or around a topic or uh, around whatever activities we're discussing. Maybe in, and a lot of times it happens in professions, but it could happen in other spaces too. 
Yeah. And I think particularly where you feel that you're sort of deliberately being restricted in those, in those activities. So, Mm -hmm. you know, people are sort of putting you in the position where you don't have an opportunity to do anything else. Yeah. So this is a noun that is used to refer to a nesting space for pigeons as one might assume. Although I kind of, (laughs) I did kind of think specifically it had to do with like where they lay their eggs, but anyway, yeah. Then it was a noun to metaphorically describe a small space for people. So this is sort of there. I, I was able to trace a little bit of, etymology on on this word or this phrase then it was used as a verb to describe putting something away in a small possibly hidden location so to pigeonhole something meant to sort of store it somewhere and then it became a metaphorical verb to classify things restrictively as being placed in small unexpandable positions this is i think a good example of why idioms can be so confusing yeah for somebody who's learning a language it is a noun, and then it's a metaphorical noun, and then it's a verb, and it's a metaphorical verb. It's We have, in its origins, four separate meanings yep. that make this one phrase very confusing. Yes, indeed. So that's pigeonholed. <laughs> <laughs> any other ones from the, from the animal section that you're thinking of, or uh, any, any ones that stick out to you? You know, when I started first researching different idioms to talk about, one that came up almost on every single source that I looked at was this raining cats and dogs. And I think it's because it's just a weird expression that <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense until you're just used to using it. And so all it means, interestingly, is heavy rain. It's just a, a really heavy rain. That's all it is. So you might say, for example, don't uh-huh. go outside in this weather. It's raining cats and dogs. And that just means it's heavy rain. Yeah. There's a really great discussion around this. There is a influencer or a TikTok user. She goes by the handle sounds sound in the forest or sounds of the forest. And she's an autistic adult who collects bugs. Okay. And it's like really excited, like really fascinated with bugs. And she does a lot of like awareness work and she's very kind and she's very sweet and and she's very insightful. And she talked about this recently and she's like, it took me a long time to understand the idiom raining cats and dogs because I had to get past my concern for the cats and dogs. Yeah. And she's describing it because it's a very literally, it sounds like this could be a very painful thing for those, for those animals. Definitely. I thought it was a a really great discussion around it. Nah, that's awesome. Yeah. The origin is really difficult to pin down. I saw several suggested hypotheses and some people later debunked those hypotheses. One suggestion was that in Britain, when there was heavy rain, then the corpses of animals that had either drowned in the rain or had just been dead somewhere else would be carried through the streets in the storm water. So then it would kind of look like they were falling from the sky. Right. And then they were joining the water that was there. Another was this idea that people kept pets in the attics and rafters of their homes. And during the storms, the animals would descend to be away from the water and the sounds of the storm. Although I did find some that heavily disputed this, saying that there's no evidence to suggest that that was common practice or that that actually happened. Right. I found another source that referred to the fact that Odin rode on the winds, which were represented by dogs and that witches fly with cats. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of another one. And then there was one more that suggested that this may have evolved from Old English catadoop, which meant waterfall and kind of sounds like cat and dog. Okay. And so those were the suggestions that I found. So it could be none of those things. It could be somewhat true for some of those things. I don't know. But yeah, that those were what I found for this one. I love it. When it comes to human history, we just kind of go, I guess this is what it is. Right. Or it could be this. It's probably nothing like that. It's probably somebody just said it one time. Like It was like a phrase like an uncle said somewhere. And then just like they started sharing it in a town and just kind of grew from there. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> wouldn't that surprise me if that's how that, that came to be? Oh, yeah, for sure. All right. Where do you want to go next? We've got so, we've got so many to do. We have a lot. Maybe food or travel. Any of those speaking to you? Oh, let's do food. Food. In the food example, the one that sticks out to me right away is proof is in the pudding. Me too. That's what I was thinking. (laughs) Do you want to take that one then? I don't want to take that from you because I just, pudding is a very interesting thing to me in general. I feel like we could do a whole episode on the psychology of pudding and why it's so weird. Yeah. But I would love to kind of know why this one stuck out to you. I feel like we kind of could for multiple reasons. And also since we (laughs) will have released our episode about why we prefer crunchy food and pudding is like the opposite of that. (laughs) 100%. Yeah. So anyway, the proof is in the pudding. This is a common saying that you'll hear that most people have heard. Of course, I I'm igno- I am not acknowledging the fact that the vast majority of our listeners are American. So mm-hmm. this means that the outcomes are the evidence of a claim. Or another way of saying this is that the real worth of something is discovered only when you put it to the test. 
And so it's sort of saying, or I was using an example here is like, it might be a good idea, but the proof is in the pudding. Or we'll see if this turns out the way we wanted it to. The proof is in the pudding is maybe a, another way to say that. Maybe these aren't great examples, but the idea being here that the proof of an idea will be tangibly visible when the idea comes to fruition and turns out the way one hoped. Right. So this comes from a, a one source that suggested that it came from the idea that the only way to find out whether a pudding was safe to eat was to eat it. That would do it. <laughs> That would do it. And also pudding in this in this case refers to the British pudding, which traditionally is a slurry of meat and blood and some spices. Now, I could see where this might come from, like some kind of maybe royal practices where they would have the person that they that the king would have that would taste the food, the tasters before the food came out. Yeah. And so that was the proof, like the proof was this pudding was safe to eat because it wasn't poisoned. I don't know if it goes back that far, but like I could see that being like a particular origin for something like this. I can see it. Yeah, that's fair. Also, worst job. (laughs) I mean, maybe it could also be the best job. (laughs) It's like all I do is just eat food all day. Nobody's trying to kill the king. Yeah, I'm I'm happy. Get some of the best food ever. Could you imagine all the anxiety that goes around with eating food, though? Like every one of them, you're like, oh, I guess this one might this might be my last meal. Like, I I feel like that would be so stressful. (laughs) That's fair. That's a good point. There's two on here that I like. One is talking about something being a piece of cake. And that one I felt was relevant because it comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was spill it or also spill the beans, spill the tea or spill your guts are all sort of different ways of saying the same thing. Both of those seemed like potentially relevant ones to tackle. I don't know. What do you think? I think both of those rule. All right. Well, I guess I'll start with spill it then. So if you ever hear the term, there's said so they're all sort of common spill the beans spill the tea spill your guts it just means to reveal or disclose some information usually something secret it could mean to confess something like that i think an example of this might be something like i know you're not telling me something so spill it uh-huh would be maybe a way that you might hear that said i don't know you have any other examples of what of way to use that i feel like it's uh one of those things where it's very focused right it's a demand like you're saying spill it it's it's actually like when you get into verbal behavior it is a man right it's a covert man for information <laughs> essentially right i mean you can make that argument for that it could be but you could also you could describe someone who maybe revealed something they weren't supposed to where they said they spilled the beans yeah and you know talk about something that happened in the past so i think yeah it, it certainly could be that way though or like the result of like a torture would be like this person spilled their guts once we exposed them to you know, waterboarding or whatever, whatever it is. I mean, that's wow. a more, that's a darker version of that, but like, yeah. uh, I don't, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I, this is, I've been reading a lot of true crime lately too. So it's like, that's where my head is at. Oh no. There's a lot of examples of where, you know, essentially what it is is just sharing information. Like, uh, you know, spill the tea is one that comes up on the internet all the time. Now it's like, and now it's actually been shortened to like, Oh honey, that's the tea, right? We like, it is shortened to the tea. As like the noun for what you would spill. The tea is now information in the, in social circles. Oh, interesting. I hadn't heard that one yet. That's good to know. Yeah. So the, the origin of this I found is potentially... Now, I found multiple sources saying this, but also some that were contradicting it. But so potentially this idea in as an ancient Greek voting system, people would vote using white beans as affirmative or black beans to reject whatever the proposal or candidate was. And then the, you would reveal the results of the election by literally spilling the beans. So you then count the, the affirmatives and the, and the nays. This could also, however, I saw this also coming from spilling the blood of an animal after a hunt. I'm not sure why that would refer necessarily to like revealing truth, but that was a suggestion that I found. So oh, interesting. unclear if either of those are totally accurate, but at least some speculated ideas of where it comes from. That's interesting stuff. Let's talk about piece of cake. I think that's one we want to get into a little bit, right? And so essentially the term piece of cake means when something is easily accomplished, it's easy. So for example, I would say, I won't even have to prepare for this. It'll be a piece of cake, right? We've said that. Oh, I don't have to take the I, the board exam. I'm not worried about the board exam. It'll be a piece of cake, which nobody ever said, by the way. That, true. This was <laughs> one that always confused me because I always, or like easy as pie is another one. And I was like, to make? Because neither of those things are super easy to make. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now that you think about it, it's like they are certainly not easy to make, especially like if you're making it from scratch. Very complex. Yeah. So I found three suggestions for where this came from. If you want, you want to take turns. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So the first one is that cake is delicious. And so eating it and swallowing it is easy. And so easy to eat as cake is to eat. I fully support that. That makes perfect sense. So <laughs> another one is... People who could afford cakes had easy, pleasant lives. And the piece of cake symbolically indicates ease and pleasantry, which actually 
when you go into uh was it Marie Antoinette who said let them eat cake that actually tracks pretty well with that particular theory there you go and then the last one that I found was in the US during the time of slavery slave owners would have their slaves participate in a dance called a cakewalk which is where that expression comes from and it is one that has roots in racism and so we should stop using it but the idea was they would participate in this cakewalk so that the white people could mock and ridicule them for their trying to do this thing they didn't know how to do and then the winner of the dance would get a piece of cake and so that's a suggested hypothesis for where this comes from for listeners out there i bet you didn't think it was going to take that turn <laughs> yeah yay. <laughs> yay oh language it's so great oh you're doing like so definitely not going to say cakewalk anymore that's i just learned that just now and you're watching me learn this in real time so uh wasn't prepared for that so <laughs> i will use piece of cake though if it's not that origin fair okay so i'm out of ideas i'm gonna go look up some more idioms and then we'll be right back While we uh, we were looking up some ideas, some people snuck in and tried to sell you some stuff, and uh, we're back though. And uh, we we have so so many that we could cover. So we have this whole section on travel, sensations, clothes and accessories, and then miscellaneous, and then some like others that I thought were good. Let's do just a couple more, and then we can get to our take-homes. And what I think I'll say is that we will publish this complete list for our Patreon supporters. Absolutely. 100%. Cool. All right. I'm going to start in the travel section. And the one that I wanted to go over specifically was one that I've used a lot. I hear a lot and I, I never really understood what it meant. I guess I understood what it meant in, in its use, but how it came to be was a mystery to me. And that was the phrase up my alley. This means something about which I am interested and familiar. Another very common version of this is in my wheelhouse, I think, is used yeah. pretty much the exact same way. Uh-huh, exactly. And so as an example, I could say, this is the perfect project for me. It's right up my alley. That'd be how I might use that phrase. I really appreciate this origin because it sounds like something baseball players would say. Yeah. Now, there's two possible origins. The first one is in baseball, the alley or hitting a ball down the alley actually refers to hitting between two fielders. I can confirm that as a baseball player myself. But more likely it was used to be right up my street. As it was used in the newspaper in 1929, which is probably a reflection of the commonality of the term. It was likely you it referred to the idea that my street or my alley were places with which we would be intimately familiar with and comfortable with. Right. So if something is in my street, up my street, in my wheelhouse, up my alley. Like I, I have a familiarity with that. So it would make sense that I would be comfortable with whatever that thing was. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, actually, when you think about it in that way. The sort of this is in my neighborhood and therefore I'm I'm familiar with it. I understand it. I can appreciate it. And so just saying up my alley is another way of saying that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Oh, 100 percent. Now, as we explore further and we go into the sensations section like we said we have a lot of different examples so our patrons will get to see all these but the one that stuck out to me the most in this one um, besides see the light was turn a blind eye or turn a deaf ear yeah and what this means is to deliberately ignore something or feign ignorance about something and so example would be my co-worker violates several company policies but his supervisors are afraid of him and they all turn a blind eye to his nonsense so that's the that's how you might see that yeah So this one was a little bit tricky to pin down as well. Most sources suggest that this comes from a naval captain, Horatio Nelson, who the name alone gives away that this was like the 1800s. (laughs) The idea that there was a very specific battle that took place during which he was given a signal to disengage from battle and he deliberately ignored that signal. And he said something to the effect of, quote, having but one eye that had the right to be blind, that has the right to be blind sometimes, end quote. Not quite a quote, but that was close to that and so that was one of the sources that i found that that suggested that's maybe where that came from is this so basically they'd wave these like flags that meant get out of there and he's like oh i don't see those flags and then just kept going because he was convinced that he could win now an earlier example is in the book men and manners although it was referring to a literal glass eye so it wasn't referring to something like a battle it was referring to a glass eye in that particular book yeah so the glass eye is actually blind because it can't see right that would would make the literal the most literal sense in that in that circumstance. Yeah. <laughs> Many sources pointed to uh, more letters from Martha Wilmot, Impressions of Vienna, in which she states, quote, turn a blind eye and deaf ear every now and then, and we get on marvelously well, end quote. 
And that was the first recorded use of the idiom, though there might be some other origins. I would say probably not a good term to use. Maybe don't use it because it might have some ableist types of tendencies to it. So yeah. I would probably not use that term anymore as well. Yeah, exactly. This this one is probably not very culturally sensitive in our modern times, but that is how it has commonly been used when people talked about it. Yeah. There's some more fun ones in here. The feeling under the weather, can't make heads or tails of something. Yes, as you said, see the light, gets under my skin. Those are all, I think, really interesting ones to unpack. But for the sake of time, we should probably start to wrap this up. And the one that actually kicked off this whole thing, and for which this episode will be titled, I assume, is okay. Uh huh. Because this is such an interesting thing that has become so universal. Right. So, okay essentially means it's a general acknowledgement of information received. It's a neutral approval of a request, and it describes a state of something as neutral, leaning good. So it's not great, it's not good, but it's okay. Right. So you could say something like, I'm feeling okay now, means I feel fine. You know, not not great, not bad, mm-hmm. but, you know, I'm all right. Yeah. Another example is something in conversation, say, can we meet at one thirty instead of 1? And you respond. Okay. Yeah. I could also say, hey, I stopped by my sister's on my way home. You say. Okay. And so those are sort of just three different ways that this is used. It's a very flexible term, but it's used to communicate any of those three things, sort of acknowledgement, approval, or relative evaluation of the quality of something. Absolutely. So the origins of this phrase or this term, it's an American tradition among people who were amused by abbreviating terms and then deliberately misspelling the abbreviation. So, for example, Nuffked. Nuff said. Nuff said, right? Uh, Which is a KC. No use. Spelled with a Y, so K-Y, or all correct, okay, right? Those are different examples of how we might say something and then abbreviate them. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. And so, yeah, going back to all correct, they spelled it O-L-L-K-O-R-R-E-C-T. And so, again, they were deliberately misspelling these because they were amused by doing this. And most of these obviously did not stick around, although I was really curious to see that Nuff said was something that people had been saying for like 150 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> it seems like it was way more modern. Yeah, than yeah that. that felt very 90s. And so it's weird. Right. Yeah. It felt like something like it was coined on Saved by the Bell or some shit like that. Yeah. It just shows that we have never grown up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So they would misspell it and then they would use the abbreviations from the misspelled version of the word and they were like completely wrong. Right. Like the no use one starts with the K N O W. And Y U S E. And even though use isn't a word, the thing K Y became the way of saying no use is K Y. But all correct was uh, this okay. Now, all correct was already a common phrase. To say that something was all correct, A L L C O R R E C T, was already a common phrase. But the abbreviated form of okay started to circulate and was first used in a newspaper in 1839. And then during the years when the telegraph gained popularity, OK was a quick and easy message to report that a message was received. So simply like, I've got everything. It is all correct was sort of, a, again, neutral way of mm-hmm. acknowledging that it, it happened. Over time, it morphed into a meaning that is all is good or all is well or something to that effect and was even required as a response to certain things. So you started seeing that kind of become a response. You see that included in now Likert scales for different assessment tools. Yeah. You see that included in all kinds of different things. It is one of the most commonly used terms or phrases that we that we have adopted since, you know, these the, the 1800s. It's really fascinating. It is, and it seems to span a lot of other cultures and languages now where if they learn anything about speaking English, they'll be able to say okay. A lot of the time, Uh a sort of an acknowledgement or receipt of something, right? One other reason that I saw that was suggested why this maybe stuck around is because a lot of brands were using K to stand in for C's in words just to stand out and make themselves more memorable. And so that's where you get a lot of the brands that we actually recognize today that use K's instead of C's in, in place of like a hard sound. I think Kit Kat as an example of one where they specifically used K's just to make it stand out a little bit. But there were several suggestions in the, in the thing that I watched, but yeah, anyway, I thought this one was really interesting, like a fascinating history of this idea that like we had these probably wealthy elitist people walking around speaking nonsense because they didn't have any, anything better to do. And they were tremendously amused by this and that ended up (laughs) 
being adopted into an almost global lexicon as just being able to say, okay, meaning, you know, various different things, which is really cool. And even just a little bit. Okay. (laughs) Well, we didn't get to touch on man, even probably half of the list that we were able to put together for this. So I don't know if it'll be worth doing a follow up at some point, maybe, maybe we'll do like a, a quick, you know, just burn through a few of these at a time or something just for fun. But in the meantime, I think that's a good place to wrap up and close out with some take home points. I think this is a perfect place for it. I mean, my big take home point with this is that language is interesting and complex. And I think there is something really powerful in being able to use different examples to illustrate a feeling or a sensation, right? When we talk about emotions and specifically the ways that we, all the words that we have to describe varying kind of nuances that go along with emotions, I think idioms kind of help us to describe a little bit more kind of the complexities and nuances of life, but also make it a little bit fun. So as you kind of explore them, they're not typically designed to be literal, but they kind of add a little flair and creativity into the way that we describe things. I do really love idioms a lot of the time. Like I enjoy engaging them in my language. I also understand how difficult they can be for people particularly those who are learning English children, for example, this is difficult people who have maybe various diagnoses thinking specifically about autism, but others as well, where the, the literal meaning of these phrases sounds really weird and maybe a little inaccessible, you know? And so I want to be mindful of that as well in thinking about these, but it's so common and ubiquitous in our language that it's not very easy to get away from. It'd be more about using this as an opportunity to just teach like, Hey, if you're learning English, particularly if you're going to be talking to Americans in English, here are some things that you're going to hear them say that are going to sound like nonsense. <laughs> and <so laughs> right. it'll, it'll help you to understand what, what they're saying if you know these phrases that are like going to show up a lot. So hopefully we provided that for somebody. I don't know. Maybe yeah. nobody, everyone was like on the, was pretty clearly informed about this, but maybe we made <laughs> sense. Maybe, maybe. Another take home point I would have too would be that it's important to understand a little bit about where these phrases come from to understand how over time these might be harmful terms, right? So as you start looking at different phrases that we might use very often, as you start to explore a little bit about the origins of whatever that term is, right? Where did that term come from? What does it mean? You know, why are we using it? You might find that in some situations, it's actually pretty wholesome. In other situations, it's actually pretty harmful, especially for marginalized groups. Yeah. So it's worth taking inventory about the idioms that you use often and also getting feedback on terms that you use and being prepared to change or find alternatives to, to idioms when there's a, a more sufficient or more appropriate and less harmful term to use. I love that take home so much. I don't even want to add another one, but I did remember I wanted to give a quick list of some of the horse idioms that I found. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. I won't give the explanation. I'll just read through the list. Okay. All right. And this is not a complete list, by the way. This is like, this is a truncated list. It is short. One that I was surprised by is hands down as a horse related Mm -hmm. idiom. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Putting the cart before the horse. Back in the saddle. Blow it out your nose. Beating a dead horse. Chomping at the bit. Those are some. Do you want to read the rest of the list? Yeah. There's also don't change horses midstream, curb your enthusiasm. Great show. Yeah. Hold your horses. The album by um, Hella called Hold Your Horse Is is a great album. Okay. Horse of a different color, Trojan horse, get off your high horse and hit the road. Yeah. So many. Yeah. Some of those are obvious that they're related, but several of them I did not actually think about. Like hands down in particular, that one really surprised me. Yeah. Also curb your enthusiasm. Yeah. It's so weird. Let's do some recommendations. Recommendations. All right. I am recommending the 2021 movie Nobody, which stars Bob Odenkirk and is sort of a John Wick meets Home Alone kind of movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is an, an action movie. I thought it was extremely well done. It was a lot of fun. It felt like there were no dull moments. I r- enjoyed every minute of it. I thought Bob Odenkirk was a tour de force. And really great in it. So anyway, that was that's my recommendation. Nobody, I know it's streaming on some platforms at the time of this recording. So uh, hopefully people are able to find it. But it was really good. Yeah, I've been wanting to see it. I heard it was really really good. So my recommendation is a band called Mock Orange. 
and this is a band that's been around for some time. Uh, if you've not heard of them, they've been around since 93 and they were kind of part of the early emo explosion when uh, bands like Promise Ring and Get Up Kids and a lot of those bands were coming up. It was like right before pop punk got big. Love Get Up Kids. Yeah. If you like Get Up Kids, if you, American Football is another band that's like kind of lumped in. Mock Orange was one of these bands that gained some notoriety and is like, I feel like very popular among that crowd, but doesn't get a lot of credit for kind of ushering in emo like those other bands do. And so I got to see them recently on a trip that I went on. Uh, I got to see Mm -hmm. them in Boston. And so I put together a playlist of that set list and it was an incredible set. One of the best bands I've seen live. They were so mellow, so mild, but like the rhythm section was so on point. Abraham, there's a point where I was, I wish you were there. To watch the drummer because the drummer was so good nice. that, I, that I feel like you would have just been like so impressed with them. So um, I put together a playlist of that set. Hopefully you all enjoy it and get, give this band a listen because they are really, really good. Awesome. And thanks for the recommendation. Yeah. I definitely like to watch really good drummers. So I, th- I figured you would appreciate that. Yeah. Their rhythm section was easily one of the best rhythm sections I've ever seen live. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. YouTube now knows to recommend people drumming as videos for me because I will usually. I like that. Yeah. I like that so much for you. (laughs) (laughs) So as I mentioned, ways you can support the show, you can join us on Patreon. You get all kinds of bonuses, things like uncut episodes, access to videos, notes, all kinds of cool stuff, uh, discounts on merch, depending on the level at which you join. You can always rate us and review us and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell someone about us is a great way to support the show if you don't want to do so financially. Another thing you can do is really fun is you can go to our merch store. We've got a bunch of brand new merch. I'm actually wearing some of our merch right now for those of you who get to watch the video if you want to see what it looks like. And it looks so good. (laughs) But we've got some really nice thumbnails up that demonstrate what our merch is looking like. So if you go to our website, we have mugs, shirts, jackets, sweaters, stickers, beanies, a water bottle, a bunch of stuff there that are available. So that's a cool place to go check out for the perfect gift. For you and your loved ones for every holiday that you can imagine from now until the end of time. I agree. (laughs) Very much so every holiday. All of them. Yes, exactly. Definitely special thanks to those people who have already joined us on Patreon and have made a huge difference for us by being these generous, wonderful souls. And that includes the likes of Amanda, Brad, Kathleen, The Daily BA, Justin, Justine, Kim, Kostia, Layla, Megan, Mike M, Mike T, and Shauna. And then my team of of good sports who hang with me through all the nonsense that I throw at them. And that is Justin, Selena, Kyle, Alan, Britt. And of course, thank you for recording with me today, Shane. As always. And then thank you for all of the listeners who, you know, make the show worth doing because people actually listen to it and you guys are great and we appreciate you. Yeah, we appreciate you so much. Do you have anything else to that I've forgotten that we need to add? That covers as much as we can in the time that we have. Yes. If you would like to tell us about some idioms that have fun origins or correct us in some of the origins that maybe we shared or add any other information about idioms, then you should reach out to us. You can reach us on all the social media platforms and you can email us directly at info at www.wwdpodcast.com. If you'd like to tell us about an action movie that you are into or a band that you saw recently that you would love to share, then you should also share those with us. We love hearing from everybody about everything. And again, thank you everyone for listening. And I think that's all I have. So this is Abraham. And this is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day. 